Hello and welcome to the Coffee Hour Muslim Chief Academy podcast. Tonight we've got Natalie Kay on. Uh, Natalie, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to be speaking about tonight? Yeah. So I'm Natalie, um, I'm a dog trainer and behaviourist. I'm based in Leeds and tonight we're going to be talking about small breed dogs, um, about the misconceptions of them, talking a little bit about what people can do as owners to get little dogs doing more um, and try and dispel some of the myths, <laughs> hopefully. Right then. Did, did you want to start talking about um, your experiences with small breeds and how you first got into having uh, a small breed? Yeah. So I've got a lot of chihuahuas. Um, my first dog was a chihuahua, Bella. Um, and I went to a class with her and I found it terrible. We didn't feel very much part of it. We were sort of outcasted. Nobody, they, we weren't a working breed, so we weren't included in the activities. We were just told to sort of sit and kind of watch. Um, so we weren't treated very well in the class. And then I decided that I wanted to learn how to do it properly without having to go to a class because I didn't want to go back there. It wasn't a nice experience at all. Um, and the people at the class were more dogs, working dogs. Um, and that might have been the class at the time. Obviously, it were a long time ago, maybe... There weren't as many, I don't know, classes for people that were force free as well. So, you know, it's definitely up and coming now. But back then, it probably wasn't so much over the last few years. Um, so I decided to then start my journey to become a dog trainer, um, mainly so that I could train my own dogs and do more things with them, but also give other people opportunities like me. So no one ever felt like I did because I didn't want anyone to feel like that. It was horrible. So how did you first end up getting a small breed? Like, was that your favourite breed, dog of choice? Um, did it just happen? Or? It, just, it just happened. So we've seen Bella advertised um, and we decided to go look at her. And she wasn't very far away from us, to be fair. And we said, oh, we'll go see. And we ended up bringing her home. And that's how the addiction started with the chihuahuas really and it went on from there um and the, the obsession continued so how old was bella when you began classes then and what type of class did you join so we joined a like obedience master class so it was like a taster session for obedience um she was only a pup so she just had the vaccinations just really gone out we got her into classes straight away so she was very very small compared to the other dogs obviously as a breed they are generally really tiny um we just didn't fit in at all and the environment was a little bit scary for her as well because there was a lot of large dogs there and it wasn't it wasn't really the safest place for her to feel comfortable and you know it just was a horrible horrible experience really and how many years ago was this so Bella probably six seven years ago Six years seven ago. years ago. Six years wow. Ago. Yeah. So we're talking about seven years ago, eight week old puppy, or what, ten weeks? Yeah. Ten weeks. Just had ten all weeks. Class. Yeah. And was it a puppy class or was it a mixed class? Or it was it Adam thinking back, it was probably more of a mixed class. They weren't all super tiny pups there, from what I can remember. Um, they were definitely probably adolescents in that class as well. So it wasn't specifically pups, which is probably one of the first mistakes that probably made with picking a class in the area and um, but there wasn't a right lot of choice at the time right and when you uh when you signed up to the classes was it advertised as a mixed class or was it advertised as a puppy class or i can't remember i think it was advertised as a maybe a mix and maybe a mix probably a mixed class it just said like a, a obedience class so there okay. was no sort of indication of what it was but at that time i had no idea as a dog owner what the difference between all the things were because I were it were all new to me and I didn't really know what any of it meant anyway. Yeah. Well that's standard across the board, isn't it really? Yeah. yeah. Well that's what dog owners find, isn't it? That they um do, just sign up to class, they don't know what they're really looking for. Or you get the other extreme spectrum where they're desperate to find a puppy class because the you know the general public ideology is that you get a puppy and you chuck them straight into puppy classes and they go wild and then that's it for six weeks. Yeah. Um. 
and obviously like we only are three years since 2020 and we're still in a COVID world even though it may not feel like it for some people so bearing in mind four years before that that's when Bella would have been a puppy so only 2016 so we're not talking the early millennium mm -hmm. we're not talking 2010 onwards well like you know, it's really recent, isn't it? Seven years in yeah. the grand scheme of things. Because yeah. we technically lost seven years through COVID anyway. Yeah. And that's scary to think, isn't it, that you attended a class that was not appropriate for your small breed of dog. Um, whereas, like, when you met me, my classes would be mixed. And I try and group the dogs together, like, according to size, temperament. Because um, you don't always have puppies. So you can't. You can't run puppy classes 100% of the time um, because you go through phases with puppy classes where you might not have anyone sign up because people don't have puppies all year round. Um, it's not a sort of the business that you can do, is it, where it's solely puppy classes? No. So I can't understand why people would do mixed classes. Um, but bearing in mind that dogs need that support especially puppies to be mixed appropriately um so do you feel that if there was a chance back then that you would have attended online classes instead of in person um obviously like not only with her being a chihuahua but a puppy as well yeah definitely because i that i wasn't set up for success at all um and it just dis made me disheartened and it made me not want to take part in anything um, and if I'd have done an online class, I wouldn't have had any of that, and I'd have been a lot. It'd have been a lot more stress free, and I wouldn't have had any sort of anybody judging me. Like I'd have just been on the camera. I wouldn't have had it, anybody putting any input in. You know, you might then comments like, "Oh, you've got a rat on a lead. Um, what? Why are you bothering bringing that? Like, oh, it'll just bite you. Um, you know, you get loads of comments like that. And to this day, I, I still get comments about the two hours. Um, when I'm out, and obviously if you're just wearing your normal clothes and you've not got dog trainer written on your back, people don't know. So they just come up to you and say, oh, I bet that's going to bite you, you know. And what's that rat on that lead for? Um, we're not quite even walking it, is there? You know, and all really, really nasty comments. And I still get them comments. Um, it's just sad, really, that they're not as accepted as, as other breeds. But so immediately you was met with misconceptions and you still are like seven years later yeah and it even puts, though you're a professional now as well yeah and it puts you off doing stuff to be fair and as a professional I think it's it has also impacted me as a professional because people do say to me oh you've only got you've got small dogs so what can how can you help me and that's not how it should be just because I've got small dogs doesn't mean I can't help somebody with a, a large breed dog no so no. it, I I feel like sometimes it has impacted my business as well by having the small dogs. So yeah. and that's really sad. Yeah, you've been through a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Um. So let's just refocus on the classes, mate, and we'll, then we'll move on off of this subject. So, um, without being biased, because obviously you come to my classes, you've been to them all through lockdown, and you help me with classes. You've been to other online classes as well. Yeah. So. As a professional, in your expert opinion, um, what would you recommend to dog owners and puppy owners now? Would you recommend uh, in person or online? I think as much as everybody wants to do in person, online has benefits that outweigh because you can completely control the environment. And I feel like some people are actually put off by going to group classes in person because they're embarrassed or they think the dog's going to show them up. And the amount of times I've heard people say, oh, actually, I'm I'm really embarrassed and I you did better than I thought. I thought they'd be awful in class. Well, you wouldn't have them feelings if you're online because mm. there's nobody there. There's nobody there to judge you and you can control the environment as much as you want. So you can make as much distraction or as least distraction as you, you need it to be. So you can do it in a, in a room where there's nothing going on or you can do it in a room where there's another dog sort of walking on by or you can do it in your back garden where there's maybe neighbours out playing kids in the street or it might be you go on the local field and there's more distractions so you can make it as hard or as easy as you want it to be but you're controlling that situation so if you feel like you don't want to go you might be doing online class at four o'clock I don't have enough spoons to feel like I want to go outside today so you just do it inside 
but you can control that environment. And I think a lot of people are a lot more sensitive coming out of COVID and especially people's emotions and things like that. People are, I think, are a lot more sensitive to stuff and, you know, there's a lot more going on. And I think by having more options, you can set yourself up for what you're, you can personally put yourself through at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Because we've both had it where, like, especially in winter um, or school times, you know, when they're going back to school after half terms or the six weeks, um, or people just generally aren't feeling it. Um, the in-person classes, sometimes you do have, um, like, an increase where people don't attend. And like you said, because they don't want to go back out. They've been at work all day. And it's, you know, hard work. You want to get any dramas, you want to stay at home. And that's obviously one of the benefits of online training, isn't it? Yeah, you don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to get in car. You know, it's it's easy. Um, it, it makes life much easier, I think. And I think people need to... Be more accepting of, of online stuff as well because I think people think oh it can't help my dog well it can we don't actually do anything with your dog anyway it's we're there just to show you what to do and then after that point it's up to you guys to practice it anyway so we're not going to be in the group class doing it with your dog for an hour anyway so it's down to you at the end of the day and you might as well just start it from scratch at home we we can't do it for you so it's I think it's the concept. I think people think in their minds that we do it for them. Yeah. And it's not that, it's them that's doing it. So you might as well do it from home. And there's not stuff distracting you, there's not stuff going on. You're not worrying about what someone's just going on in the corner or other dogs barking as a distraction. You know, you, you're in complete control. So that brings me to my next point, which you did beautifully. Um, would you say that you feel that in the online classes that you've attended that you get more one-to-one -one support than you would in an in-person class? Yeah. Yeah. I think because you, you have that time, sort of have your moment and your sort of, that's your bit, say, do you want to show, show what you've been doing? Um, And you've got obviously the online group to have that support throughout the week. Um, I mean, some trainers do do that, but not all trainers have support groups as well to have people so they can post videos and stuff. And obviously we have the community as well where people can post the videos and support there. Um, and I think people are a bit too shy about filming themselves, but I think you've just got to get past it and put your videos on there so people can see how you're getting on. But it also encourages other people to who probably sat at home saying, I wish I could put my video on to, to put their videos on too. And it encourages other people to take part. Um, but yeah, I think... It's a, it's a tough one, but I think you can sort of get more out of the session because you can concentrate. You don't have to go in on because you can't come as much as you can give someone alone time in a class. You can't, you can't control like another dog barking across the room and then that distract the person and they're kind of looking and not really concentrating on what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Because of course, moving to more modern four, three ways and embracing force free as an entire concept um in-person classes are really overwhelming for dogs when you look at it isn't it because yeah, it's not for, remember... it's not for every dog it's really not it's not and people think that that's the thing to do and it it really isn't sometimes it can have a negative effect on a dog and you know a lot of trainers as well they don't have the guts to tell somebody this is not for you they just let them come regardless yeah. if it's good or not for the dog because they want that set of money for that course you know with online you don't have that everybody's welcome it doesn't matter how good or bad your dog is you know if they bark they bark we can solve it you know but it doesn't matter about disturbing other people because you're in your own little bubble yeah um but yeah it's it's more accepting of people i think online rather than yeah. being i sign up for these classes i'm not really enjoying myself i'm just sat there like yeah yeah, because there's a lot of exclusion, isn't there? And when COVID first hit, everyone was panicking, like, oh, my life, how are we going to do classes online? And then, actually, as we got into it, it's like, wow, this is so much better for the dog ethically. It truly embraces force-free where they're not overwhelmed. There's no risk that a dog's going to get away from their owner and attack another dog. So the risk has been entirely eliminated. The dog and the puppy are much happier in their own homes. The owners are a lot happier when they admit it once I've actually tried it instead of just shutting it down straight away, not attempting it. Um, and it's more accessible for obviously disabled people as well. Even if your venue's uh, yeah. accessible, you've still got the problems of 
having to travel, face traveling, even if it's an invisible, invisible disability and it's anxiety or PTSD, just traveling to a class can be hugely overwhelming, can't it? Yeah. Um, and then the other problem with classes is you've got to wait for your vaccinations and for your puppy to be able to go outside before you can even attend an in-person class. Yeah. And then when you do, you take them to a small room and you overwhelm them because they're surrounded by all these dogs. So for a poor two hour, and obviously small breeds across the board, that's even more terrifying and overwhelming. Is that what you found with Bella that you struggled because she was so scared? Or was it the exclusion or was it a mix? Or I think the exclusion didn't help, which impacted how I was feeling, which made her probably the way she was because I was probably panicking and just yeah. wanted to leave. So my emotional state affected probably Bella more than Bella was affected. Yeah, and that's totally normal. Yeah, so I, my energy probably didn't help matters because I was yeah. I want to leave, but I can't leave. I'm trapped in this hall. Oh. So, um, I think I didn't help. Bella did fine, but we were included in activities because we were not part of the gang. So, that's so sad. Yeah. So let's talk about all this exclusion that you've experienced then as a, well, a small dog owner because that's where it comes from and the perceptions of you as a trainer that you can't train a dog because a small dog's like when you told me that somebody put on was it a facebook group that they was looking for a dog trainer and someone mentioned you and there's like, like no a proper trainer or something like those lines so if you want to talk more about that because obviously you went through it <laughs> yeah so i think people obviously know that i've got small dogs i post pictures of my small dog so if people look for me on Facebook, they're going to see that I've got small breeds. Um, and unfortunately, people seem to think that because I've got small breeds, I'm incapable of training large breed dogs. But actually, the majority, majority of dogs that I teach are large breed, breed dogs um, because there isn't that many small breeds in the area, to be fair. Um, so it's a case of, it, it's people's misconception that because I've got small breeds, that that's going to have an impact on me as a, as a trainer and behaviourist um and that's really sad and it also makes me not want to do stuff with my own dogs because I think oh I'm just gonna get judged because I've got smaller breeds um you know there's there is more up and coming when you go on the breed specific groups there is stuff on there that's not very nice like it's mainly dogs in prams and dogs two hours that are house trained and that's all you really see um on these groups you don't actually see dogs being trained or or mainly dogs being sort of restrained um i mean i sent you one the other day where um they turned the two hour into a picture of hannibal lecter because they couldn't cut its nails um and i just think it's scandalous like the poor dog just needs some training and help like you're making it so uncomfortable by i've got see pictures of chihuahuas in carrier bags with holes cut out to cut their nails uh, it's just scandalous and stuff on these breed groups and it's really really sad to see um that they're just not treated like proper proper dogs really and they're not doing well, the things a massive prejudice in britain don't we about well not just britain but because we're in britain we'll talk about it because obviously we're residents here um but it is right across all countries um like you said about the bag, um, I've seen Staffordshire Bull Terriers, Pit Bulls and American Bulldogs being put into them as well. And it's so sad because you know, you just think, obviously my YouTube is full of collaborative care instructional videos. Why not just go on and just learn how to do consent with your dog instead of manipulating them and putting them into that position? Um, and like you said, with two hours, you see so much negativity from the owners themselves and that's perpetuating the nasty comments that you're getting essentially like obviously not directly but the attitude like the attitude towards Staffordshire Bull Terriers and pit bulls um and all type dogs and the way that people carry on you'd think that Chihuahuas, Dachshunds, Westies, Jack Russells were all of a part of that and what people don't tend to see in my opinion is the trainability of these dogs and what these dogs are actually capable of doing um, and that, you know, the owner guardian is the biggest advocate for their dog to begin with. And if they're perpetuating the cycle, you know, by photoshopping videos 
for a few likes, you know, that's the detriment of their dog. That's like putting a Photoshop of of your own human child and then, you know, saying something awful about your child. It's just not right, is it? No. I think I saw the biggest change when I took Chunk on, so Chunk's a friendship, and people wanted to meet up with me and go on walks, and they wanted to go on play dates, and they wanted to meet me, whereas I've never, ever, ever had that with the Chihuahuas. Never. And I was like, this is really this is really bizarre. Like people want to go on walks, people want to meet up, people want to socialise with me because I've got chunk. And that was so bizarre. I've never had anyone ever say, Do you want to meet up with two hours? Mm-hmm. You don't get it. You just don't get that. Um and yeah. I think it made it more apparent to me how two hours are perceived as a breed when I got a different breed because there's no it was a completely different experience. That's really sad, isn't it? Yeah, and I've I've had chunk probably a year and a half. Um and I get a lot more attention for him and people like, we love chunk and they give him a fuss when you're out walking, everyone knows him. Um my neighbour walks chunk every day and he's got a little fan club like he goes like and has cuddles with other people on his walks that he sees every day. Um, I've never had that with the Chihuahuas. No one even bothers to even know the names. Of. That's really sad, and it is sad as well, isn't it? That again, people don't see dogs as individuals. Like with the wolf dogs, it's not that they're interested in the wolf dogs. It's Game of Thrones. It's can I take a picture with your wolf dog? No, they're my family. They're not a poster opportunity. Um. And wanting to force them to then say that they've stroked a wolf. And people don't see the individual, like, my dogs are all individuals. They're not there for your post opportunities or your status or your street cred. They're my family at the end of the day. Whereas with Diesel, everyone loves Diesel. Everyone wants to fuss Diesel. They're scared of the wolf dogs, yet they want to take a photo with them to do their street cred. And then with yourself, Chunk, everyone wants to be friends with Chunk. But then it comes to the two hours and they're not interested and you get insults like, you know, obviously they're rats and the other inappropriate comments that you get. And it's just not nice, is it? No. I mean, I went somewhere this week for an appointment and um, somebody came in and they said, oh, she'll bite me. I went, she won't bite you. Wow. She will not bite you. So if you had a pound for every time that you've had that comment, because I know over all these years you've had it a lot, you'd be a millionaire, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I'd be a millionaire. I went, she will not bite you. She don't, and she just walked up to me and licked him. I was like, oh, I want But yeah, it's um, it's it's not nice. It just makes you feel rubbish. And it yeah. puts you off going out with them because you're just like, oh. And, you know, there is a lot of them in push chairs and stuff. I know some of them for medical reasons do, do need it for medical reasons. Um, Absolutely. But most of them don't need to be pushed pushed around. And it's sad, really. You see it a lot of, like, the car boots and things like that. A lot of dogs in push chairs around. We had it every, everywhere's different. Different areas are different. Um, so, you know, when we come on holiday, Skeg, I see a, a lot as well. Like, they're in, like, baskets and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it's just not, it's not good. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame, really. It's the only way to describe it. Yeah, because when I first met you, was it York, wasn't it, for Dr. Robert Hewins' uh, PTSD sent yeah. course for the day, wasn't it? Um, and I remember you speaking to me on the lunch break about you wanted to be a dog trainer, but you wasn't qualified as a dog trainer, and you was worried about setting up a business and classes because people wouldn't take you seriously. And that was all because of you having small breed dogs, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How sad is that, that you don't feel that you can become a dog trainer solely based on the breed of dog that you have? And obviously I kicked your butt and we got you sorted, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and here you are today. Um, but that's really sad. That So was that the one experience with Bella that formed that opinion? Or was it more experiences or... It was just that one, really. Was just it, the one experience with Bella. Why I wanted to to do it because I needed to teach my own dog stuff. Oh no, sorry. I mean, um, was it the one experience with Bella that made you feel you couldn't be a dog trainer? Um, 
Or was it several experiences? It's a few experiences with that. I think it was an accumulation of like, I did take Bella on a dog training course with me as like practice. Um, and it kind of, it was kind of, I was the only one there with a small breed again. Um, and it's just, it's just a straight, it's, you just don't feel like you're part of anything. You feel kind of excluded, like you've got like a unicorn in the corner. It's really weird. Um, but it didn't, it, at the time, it's never put me off to sort of go and get go out of my way to go like a border collie or whatever. Yeah, I've sort of struggled through it. I've not gone out of my way to buy a purchase a dog or get a dog that would make me feel any better about being a dog trainer. I've muddled through it. Um, so I'm glad that I didn't cave like early on, like get Bella and then go get a big breed because of the way I felt. I kind of stuck with the chise. It, it was, it's was. it been quite damaging to your mental health, in all fairness, over the years, hasn't it? Yeah. Because um, you have had times where you've thought about rehoming the dogs or going out and getting a breed that you feel the industry would then accept you as a professional and clients would accept you as a professional. And that's a lot to go through, isn't it? Because of that feeling of a lack of acceptance. Yeah. And to this day, I don't really put a lot of stuff on my business page, to be fair, about the chihuahuas. I don't. I just leave it. And is that because of the experience with the lack of acceptance? Probably, yeah. Yeah. That's really sad. Yeah, I just don't I see. I don't see value in putting it on, apart from the fact people are asking me to say. Mm. And I can't be bothered with the comments. So I just don't. Yeah. But it puts you off going places like, you should be able to go to appointments and stuff and not have someone say something like, oh, she's going to bite you. Or yeah. she's going to bark at you. Because the lovely dogs, and you know, I have got some that are not that. Well, I've got some some of the rescue ones that are that social. Um, but none of them are aggressive in a way that they'd attack another dog or they'd bite somebody. Um, you know, they've all done loads of training. They've all done trick dog titles. And I, I always make a point of saying to people, like, you know, they've all done trick dog titles. They've all done dog park all. They've all done, done everything. So there's nothing that they haven't done that your dog can't do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just the same. We've all done the same stuff. Yeah. See, it's really different, isn't it? So you've got imposter syndrome based on your chosen breed of dog. I have crippling imposter syndrome because of my mental health problems and poor experiences with not very nice people. Um, and obviously clients and stuff um, who were just like, they think that booking dog training is McDonald's <laughs> and you should be working every bank holiday weekend as well. If you don't answer within like two hours, it's the end of the world. And we all know it doesn't work like that. But you can't take away... The experience so the experience that that one particular person put me through even though people can talk me through it no one can take the negative feelings associated with that because it was just so out of well it was ridiculous wasn't it I mean on the website you say it can take up to 48 hours to get a response and never before has somebody complained because they've had a response in two hours um, and obviously, like it says on my Facebook profile, go to the business page because I don't get message requests. And that woman took it upon herself to then, you know, try and destroy me. And she did a pretty good job. She did drop and kick me for quite a few months, didn't she? Yeah. Um, and then you've got yourself, who's had bad experiences with the way that people perceive your dog. So imposter syndrome in itself is vast, isn't it? And no one's going to have the same two experiences and we're going to have imposter syndrome for different reasons aren't we yeah yeah and I think it, it's not just with trainers imposter syndrome it's with owner with like dog owners as well like they feel like they can't do certain things or experiences so you've got to consider not only your own imposter syndrome but also other people's imposter syndrome and how mm. they're probably feeling and I think people don't really think about other people are feeling sometimes no um and it's especially really since covid yeah they've got no filler on their mouths <laughs> what oh, they're no. and it, it's upsetting and you know they don't really think it through 
or how that might impact a person. And I think it's got worse since COVID, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, because when I first met you, you know, obviously we've talked about what was first said and things. And then I began working with you online before COVID anyway, and was getting your dogs through the trick titles and encouraging you to do as many titles as possible because your dogs are proper dogs and that are able to do things. And then we worked through reactivity problems, handling problems. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about uh, Dottie, who could be considered a stereotypical negative small dog, because uh, I'm going to completely turn this on its head. So if you want to explain about Dottie, your feelings and your emotions around Dottie, and also just drop Dottie's full breed. <laughs> yeah, so Dottie is a terrier cross chihuahua. No, she's a chalky. Um, so she is um, very feisty. Um, Dottie was hand-reared um, with no mum. Um, I hand reared her every two hours and I had a lot of problems with handling Dottie and picking her up when she got over the point of the bottle feeding and things like that she's very she was very well she was very snappy she's very she could turn on you at any point um, and I really really struggled with that and I, I took it very personally because I'd got up every two hours to feed her and then she started biting me um, and that is very breed specific, to be fair. Like, that's what people expect them to be like. Um, you know, you see these funny videos with people at like, stroking trials and they're like biting them. And, you know, that's what she was a little bit like. Um, I don't know if that was because I bottle fed her. Um, if she's because she's a singleton puppy. I wrapped her in cotton wool quite a lot. I made quite a lot of mistakes with her. Like I didn't so I didn't socialise her with the other dogs quite as early as what I have done other dogs that I've hand reared um, because I was so scared about losing her because I'd lost a mum that I just didn't want to lose her so I didn't want to put her in and anything happened to her um, so she was quite late in joining the gang so to speak um, but I, I had loads of tears on her like not being able to pick her up, not being able to put harnesses on um, and it we did quite a lot of work on her, didn't we, Tasha, to try and get through it because as much as I had knowledge, I actually couldn't get through the problem myself because it was all just too upsetting. Um, but we managed to get through it and I, she doesn't, she's not like that at all now. You might get the odd thing here and there, but nothing. She walks off lead. She can walk her anywhere, like can walk through a car boot and she just like, mm. you can use her as a stooge dog and she just walks on by like what's wrong with these she has no fear or anything she's an amazing dog like I cannot fault her now but during that first year it was awful like it was really really awful and she was what people think that the breed is like snappy barky you know biting the people's fingers she because she was like that she really was but we worked through it and we got past it so there's no reason why no one else can get past it also. It's just a case of trying and not accepting that's what they're like. Because I could easily have sat there and be like, that's what she's like, just don't touch her. Exactly. But you can't do that. Old... You to work on it. Sorry, how old was Dossie when we began working together? I can't remember. I can't remember. She might have been about a year, maybe. Two years. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're super transparent, aren't we? We've got nothing to hide. I know you spoke about this before, but so we were doing our online class with canine conditioning and you had to handle her and she bit you, burst into tears and you left, didn't you? Yeah. Um, and you was like, you can't do anything with her. Because obviously he's emotional at this point. There's nothing wrong with that because we all say things that, you know, when we're emotional. He said, you can't do anything with her and all the rest. I was like, we're going to work with her. I'm going to do one-to-ones. I'm going to get this sorted. And like you said, now you can't fault her. You said, no, she's an amazing dog. And you was hesitant to begin with, but you put in the effort. And we worked long distance, didn't yeah. work together. Um, and we did it and we got through it. And I sent you YouTube videos of two hours that I've worked with in the past. Because obviously in my area is inundated with small breeds. In your area, it's inundated with large breeds. Very large. So 
I had lots and lots and lots of Chihuahua Terrier um, small breed experience. And I think when you start to see the YouTube videos of these changed Chihuahuas, who also had fear, you know, you, and when you address that fear, how different these dogs became and that they could take on the world if they wanted to once the training had like, you know, well, not even when it finished, when you got to the middle of the training, really, like the difference in their behaviour. Um, and it's quite prevalent amongst small breed dogs to lose their mums as well, isn't it, during birth? Yeah, it, it can happen, um, you know, in any breeding, it can happen. Um, but I, you do tend to see it more in small, in small breeds. Um, it was nothing... Stella's passing was nothing to actually do with her really so much having a litter. She went to the vets and she got meningitis um, and some other things going on. And that's the reason why she passed away. Um, there wasn't much we could have really done to change to change that. Um, it was just unfortunate. It might have been laying dormant in a system. And then when she's had the litter, it's come out. It's There were no sort of explanation. But you do tend to see more... Um, deaths in, in the smaller breeds when they're having litters. So straight away, like, so it's not your breeding that was a problem. You didn't unethically breed. You chose suitable parents. Yeah. The genetics was perfect, technically, weren't they? And so for poor Dottie, you've got epigenetics, where her genetics have probably been affected by the meningitis and her mother's trauma while she was pregnant with her. So prenatally, poor Dottie's already gone through trauma. Yeah. And then Dottie was the only surviving puppy, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, so she's got no siblings and no mother. So for her first secure emotional attachment, which should be her mother, it was yourself. Yeah. And for a puppy, because they're neurologically developing, so for people who don't know, that's when the brain's developing. So puppies are born both blind and deaf, um, and then they get their sight. With the, you explain it, they get the sight and hearing when? About 10 days. So about 10 days. About 10, you start seeing like ears starting to open and eyes open and things like that. Um, and they start sort of move every some breeds are different, but yeah, around around that point, up to like 14 days, you start seeing the eyes open and things like that. Um, so the first four weeks our brains are really, really developing like a little sponge. So because puppies are born with a sense of smell, she's taking in your smell constantly which you could argue is a little bit of early neurological stimulation. So she would have had to attach to your scent. Um, so it's not that you did anything wrong or that your handling was wrong. It was literally the trauma. And you can't say to them, oh, when did you get trauma? When was your first experience of trauma? Was it before you was born? Or was it after you was born and realising that you're an orphan and you don't actually have a mother of your own species? Um, and when people realise that, you know, that puppies cannot go through trauma prenatally before they're born and postnatally, whether they've lost a mother and the mother rejects them, there's no other siblings or a sibling attacks them quite early on or the mother attacks them even. Yeah. All sorts can happen, can't yeah. it? Yeah, there's loads of stuff that can happen. And trauma can dictate, as obviously we've seen with Dottie, how the behaviour can change so vastly from the paired breeding sort of thing, can't it? Yeah. Um, so what would your advice be to people who do have uh, singleton puppies where the breeder's gone, no, I'm not keeping a puppy just because we're singleton, I'm selling them, and then suddenly no one has got a puppy that has severe trauma with no emotional attachment or secure attachment to their owner? Yeah. I think singletons are a very specific topic on their own. Um, and I don't think there's enough out there about singletons to warn people if they are getting a singleton puppy either. And a lot of breeders don't really explain to people what it entails when you've got a singleton pup. You know, there's not enough out there. I've seen quite a lot of singleton pups over the years and that they've not been told like anything to do with why that dog may be a little bit different. And they are different. They are very, very different. They're usually quite socially quite 
not not the same as a normal dog because they've not had litter mates to play with, depending on how soon the breeders let the dog play with if they've got other dogs in the house, that can have an impact. Um, you know, if they've been bottle fed, it's very different to some people use like these um feeders that have got like fake nipples around them and they just put the milk in them and they put them in the pens and the puppy just latches on, which is a very different experience from you having a bottle and bottle feeding the puppy. So there's two types of that which could influence the behaviour of the dog also and being handled because a dog that's bottle fed is handled quite a lot, whereas a dog that just gets a, a fake nipple plopped in the pen with some milk is having a, not, not a lot of handling at all. So there's different experiences with that as well. So there's quite a lot to sort of think about when you've got singletons. And I think breeders need to be honest with owners a little bit more about singletons and what they've done if they've bottle fed or if they've used these feeders or, you know, if they've socialised them early on or some people also, if they've got another litter, they will put the pup in with another litter they've got so that it's not their mum. And they don't always take, so there's that to contend with as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot to it, and I don't think breeders are always honest with people about what they've got. Um, but yes, singleton pups are very niche; they're very different from a normal puppy. And do you feel that breeders aren't transparent with potential no owners? Then no, I don't think they're on. I don't think they're honest. I think some breeders are probably a little bit. Um, maybe don't want to be honest about it because they feel a bit sad about it or you know sometimes if they've lost mum it's quite traumatic having to give that pup to somebody if you know and that's why I've always kept if I had a singleton it's been kept because I quite can't part with them Um, you have a very different bond with a singleton puppy because you spent every two hours feeding it and getting up in the night every two hours and feeding it so for me I'd find it very difficult to give that dog to somebody because you've raised a baby almost you know you've kept it alive for eight weeks I keep puppies uh 12 to 14 weeks sometimes like they're with me quite a long time until I feel like they're big enough and strong enough to go to a new home anyway um if I couldn't imagine giving them at eight week especially the breed that I do um I just think they're just too little um but people need to be honest and say this dog singleton that comes with challenges and there isn't, there isn't a lot of resources out there to be fair for people with singleton dogs because conversely you've got because uh, obviously no mental health is the same um but you do have some people who's lost some other and then they want to give the puppy away because it's too traumatic for them to keep the puppy because it's a reminder of the mother and that loss it's a big deal isn't it yeah a big massive deal yeah yeah and obviously grief is so broad and different for everyone isn't it yeah yeah, either reminds them of the dog they've lost, so they like, I just, want, I just want the dog gone, or it might be that they need the dog gone because they don't have space, but they don't really want to give it give it up. Um, there's lots of things that go with it, but yeah, I don't think people are always honest. I think there's probably more singleton puppies out there than what we realise. So, you know, um, obviously it's so different across every individual dog anyway. When they get foster mums in, um some species such as like horses for example um when they've bred a horse if the mother's died or the mother's rejected the foal they'll try and get a foster mare yeah. um but some mares don't want to take either so they have to be given um an injection from the vet to start lactating and produce yeah. milk to hopefully develop a bond between foal and foster mother is it the same principle for dogs as well yeah, so I see quite a lot in the breeding groups people looking for people with mums that can take these pups on. So sometimes they're mixing breeds and mums as well. Like it's really, it's really quite strange. And sometimes if mums are still lactating, they'll try and latch on newborn pups. When mums nearly finished, and that's quite traumatic for the mums. You know, they've just thought that it were over, and now they're starting again with this dog that don't even that's not theirs. It don't, they don't always take. Um, some dogs aren't natural mums. Um, and so there's that's... quite a lot of morals and ethics around it, isn't, isn't there? Because poor mum's been expressing milk. She's, you know, going through a lot of hormonal changes from being pregnant to not being pregnant to then 
feeding her puppies and then saying to the puppies, leave me alone now, to then being forced to take on another puppy, yes, to preserve life. Um, but if you want to talk about the ethics around that, because that's a, that's a big deal. Oh, and obviously it's a very dark yeah. area, isn't it? The dark area. I think you you do what you want to do to try and save the puppy. I wouldn't ever consider it. Um, I think if people have got like a big litter, if they've got like four or five pups, it's quite hard to then start bottle feeding them pups. So I do get why people do it, but I couldn't personally do it. And then I'd be worried. Like, it's not just that you're putting that responsibility on this other person. Like this human has now got responsibility of your puppies. And where does that lie? If one of them dies, like you're going to then resent that person or like, what do you, do you pay them? Or do you, yeah. like, what, how do you go about it? You know, it's it's very strange. I always, I've always found it very bizarre, but I do see it a lot on the breeding groups. Um, yeah. A lot of people looking for foster mums for dogs. Um, some people are very traumatised. Like when we lost Stella, um, the vets actually bottle fed Dotty for a day for me so that I could sort of get my head around it because I'd never bottle fed. I talked before, oh, nice. and you know they helped me. They showed me how to use bottles. If the vets hadn't shown me that, I don't know what I'd have done. Yeah, but there's other things like some breeders do tube feeding. I wouldn't attempt that. That's scary. Like I'm not sure. Um, a lot of them do the the tube feeding. Um, yeah. and a lot of the time these dogs are really they're not quite strong as well, so yeah. they're quite weak, and you have to give all the other sort of like liver water, um, puppy skin. You know, they need they need a lot. I have to admit, I've kind of stayed away from breeding because obviously I know what to look for and what you're looking for in the academia sense. And I know about pairings, genetics, epigenetics, all that sort of thing, obviously in postnatally. But when it comes to breeding itself, because I've had traumatic experiences around it, which I'm not going to go into, but I've had traumatic experiences. I think that's massively put me off. Um, but for me, it's just how people can use a mother that's either lost all of her puppies um, or making a mother continue to lactate. It's like, it just doesn't sit right with me ethically. Um, the one experience I will talk about is obviously when I was supposed to be getting a German Shepherd puppy and when I was at the kennels and the Shepherd was imported from Poland and she was supposed to be pregnant and it turned out that she'd absorbed all the puppies but one and I went into work I found my puppy in the bin. Like, oh, still not over it to this day. Extremely painful memory. Um, and they as breeders, well, they, you know, it was a puppy mill, essentially. I'm quite comfortable saying that because of the amount of dogs that they bred. Um, and she, apparently she was pacing around with this puppy in her mouth, distressed. She gave birth at like midnight or something like that. Pacing around this quite small whelping shed. Uh, we have a puppy in a mouse, so they thought the best thing to do is like, Let, let's not bury the puppy or have it cremated. Let's chuck it in the bin for the kennel hand to find in the morning. Like, ugh. So that's why, like, it's massively put me off breeding quite a lot because obviously my experience was it, it was cold hearted and then they bred chihuahuas as well and seeing the chihuahuas tied and the screams and the distress and... Like, just the things that I've seen have massively put me off. Um, and I can understand when you lose a puppy at birth, it's really, really difficult. Um, but again, at the same time, she needed time to heal. She was going through her own trauma of loss. Um, so to me, it doesn't ethically sit right and say, right, well, all her puppies have died. We'll just give her some puppies without a mum or with too big a litter to start feeding them. Because... That individual dog has their own trauma as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so have you had any mums that have like lost all of their puppies or have you been lucky in that sense? I have been lucky in that sense, we've not lost them all. We have lost pups, um, but not lost all all of a litter. Um, you know, it, and it is hard for the mums, you know. I think it's really hard when they lose them all because then you've got them still lactating, they're looking for puppies. You know, I, I see, I do see it. Um, and then you've got a job like making sure they don't get mastitis and 
all them kind of things. Like there's a lot goes on if you lose all the pups. It's quite, you know, quite scary stuff. Um, and it is difficult. And you know, it, I can't imagine the people that lose like the full the full litter and then they've got a mum that's still searching for pups. That poor dog, you know, that poor bitch like looking for the babies and there isn't any. It's horrible to see. It really upset me to see. Like it was traumatic. The whole process was traumatic. And then the mother afterwards, like how she wasn't coping. She she had developed anxiety. Even though she didn't see a vet, it, you didn't have to be a vet to see that this mother had developed, you know, quite bad anxiety. And then with her own, it was just send her back to Poland. There was no aftercare or let's sort out her trauma. How can we help her? That kind of thing. Um, so how do your mums react when they've lost puppies but had surviving puppies? They actually cope quite well. Um, okay. So it's not as traumatic as what you probably think if you lose. It's better if you lose them early on, like if they're just not thriving or there's something wrong. Um, but generally, they kind of they may look around a little bit, but you've got to whip them away and then, you know focus on the ones they've got on the duck actually seen mine have never seen too bad when something like that's happened I mean we don't have lots of litters like we may have one litter a year or something like that I've had a litter for ages um so it's a case of you know if, if that was to happen I don't really know what I would do to be honest we have not been in that situation to lose all litters lose a whole litter it's, it's traumatic for mum so just to focus on breeding, and the reason we're focusing on breeding, because uh, we discussed it, wasn't it, that um, we want owners to understand, to fully understand their dog. Um, so again, um, with breeding, I was horrified, because obviously I stepped back from breeding, I had a massive trauma, I had no interest in going back near breeding to be re-traumatised. But what upset me, because obviously I've paid attention to you for your breeding process, is when you said that the is no standard for two hours as that is for larger breed dogs with the kennel club so with the genetic testing yes specific do you want to just talk through that because i'm still horrified <laughs> yes yeah, so certain breeds have certain genetic testing um before they were to be bred but in two hours there actually isn't any specific tests health tests to be done you can have tests done and you can have genetics done so some of my studs have had genetic testing and like, for example, look in patella scores if they've got, you know, like to make sure they haven't got any problems with the legs or hips. So you can have all them tests done. There's nothing stopping you pain and having them things done, but there is no rules about it. So um, for the breed standard, there's no health testing. That's really damaging having like even hip and elbow scoring on its own away from genetics. That's massively damaging to the breed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, and I think I think it is important, like, um, because a lot of them have leg problems, for example, and especially with certain colours as well. Now, I think having DNA done and genetic testing should be done as standard to make sure you're not having any crossover with colours and things like that, because you can have a lot of problems diluting genes and especially in like blues and things like that. Um, so people should be having tests done regardless whether it's there's a breed standard or not. Um, it's still important to have tests, but it's not compulsory in the breed. And I've done, I'm not sure about other breeds, to be fair, because I've only really looked at two hours. But I don't know if there's how much testing there is in other breeds or if there's other breeds that don't need health tests. I know for my guys and large breed dogs, there you know there is a lot of health testing that's gone on. And obviously, since the standard has changed for breeding, you've got to have a council license. It's changed even more. Um, so, do you think it's easier for people to breed chihuahuas because there is no, like, there's no forced health testing? Um, maybe I've not really thought about it. Maybe so. I, th I don't think the people that um are going to do it without a license they're going to do it regardless what the breed is and um, you'll never really stop i think they'll struggle to stop that completely i think they'll struggle to stop people do doing breeding without a license um i think it's just 
one of them things that you can't really stop. But I think it is important. And, you know, if someone wants to use a stud, for example, I'd say they've had this done and they've had that done and, you know, you can DNA, things like that, if you want to see it. But people aren't really interested. So, um, you know, there should be more, edu- more of a major educational piece on what DNA is or what tests that can be done because, you know, a dog that can be fine before breeding sometimes afterwards can develop problems anyway as well so a leg problem that they may have had no leg problems before tested not not an issue and then a year later a leg problem can develop so mm. regardless of having the testing stuff can still happen yeah. so sometimes the testing is pointless because as much testing as you do stuff can still happen later down the line it's 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 a tough one really but i don't yeah, and you've got throwback genes as well yeah so there's a lot there's a lot to it um but no i'm not sure it has an influence on like how easy it is to breed i think people do it anyway so with you not really thinking about it's going to be interesting so throwing back again um when i did my level six with ispcp do you remember that i studied two hours um i think the question was that you needed to find a breed of dog that was rehomed the most in the UK without using a questionnaire. So I went onto the pre-loved and all of those horrible websites, and I must have found over 800 chihuahuas, the most prevalent breed that needed a new home or that was being advertised. And they weren't just litters of puppies. These were six-month-old chihuahuas or year-old or ex-breeders that they didn't want anymore or senior two hours and you know like anywhere from 12 to 16 years old um so because in the uk mostly people think rescues are inundated with staffordshire bull terriers which yeah we are um but in scotland it's huskies and obviously two hours french bulldogs small breeds of dogs are inundated in specialist rescues across country and then you have pre-loved um so if you wanted to talk a little bit about that because obviously you've not thought about it before um and just yeah. how that kind of makes you feel i think i see a lot of older true i think people don't realize how long they're going to live for um i think that's quite apparent in like the communities like they live if they live up to like 20 like some of them are really old and i don't think people realize that when they get them how old they can become um and people start to struggle with like the way they are when they're older, like toileting issues or general care when they're old. And I think that's another reason why a lot of people then go and try and get a new home for them. Um, yeah, I've not really thought about like the rehoming side of it. I do see it a lot, mainly down to toileting issues on the groups mainly, or them being snappy or they've bitten a child or something, or some, there's been an incident. Um, I've not, I don't see it too much. I've not seen it as much recently, but I've definitely seen it in COVID on the groups, people rehoming quite a fair bit. It, it was sad for me, and it was like, wow, because obviously, like I said, inundated by small breeds around here, particularly. Um, the more rural you get, the more rural you get out, which isn't hard in Lincolnshire, the more large breeds that you work with, which is why I've got such vast experience. But for me, it was really sad because it was like, you breed these dogs, you make money off them, they're not family, and then you sell them, or six-month-old puppies. They may have just started forming an insecure attachment and you're rehoming them. And it, the issues that you have with trials mean teething problems and teeth. That that happens when they're young, mm. not just when they're old. Um, and the health problems that you can get with trials because... They're so inbred quite a lot, aren't they? Like you said about DNA, and the whole point of DNA is to make sure that you're not inbreeding. But quite a lot of chihuahuas are inbred because there's only so many chihuahuas to breed from in the UK. And if you're importing them, the chances are that all studs are imported sort of thing. So you're getting into like even more of a grey area there as well. So the ethics around breeding are like really shaky, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they are to be fair. And I think a lot of the rehoming with trials is they just don't have any training. No, not all. 
because no one knows what to do with them. They just think they just sit on the knee all day and they're not they're not all like that. So obviously you strive to be an ethical breed as you can. I know because I've been there for all of the fallout, the tears and everything, the temperatures, the licensing process. Um, what would you say to an owner who was looking for not just a chihuahua but any breed of dog? Because we recently had someone contact us and they didn't know that they had to have a licensed breeder. So when I said to them, make sure your breed is licensed, it was, what does that mean? And I was like, oh, no. Okay, I refer you to Natalie. So if you just want to explain, so for any owner that's listening, so they know what to look for, yeah, so they don't get duped. But just in a lot of, uh, I spoke to this lady we were talking about here, like she didn't realise that um, breeders needed licences. She didn't understand anything about what to look for on an advert and what to look out for when they go visit a puppy or, um, you know, should be looking to see if they've got a licence for a star. Um, and how many stars they've got. So stars is based on it's big, just like food hygiene. You know, it, the amount of stars you've got is is based on the criteria that you've fitted and how you look after your dogs. Um, it is quite difficult to get a five star license. Um, and it can take a lot of years because generally when you first apply, you do get a low level of stars and then you work your way up. So the longer a person's been doing it the more stars they've got and the longer the license will stay for. For example, my license is five stars and they won't come out to me for three years. So it's a case of the more stars you've got, the the longer you've got your license for before they come and check you. Um, and they can come out at any point, so they could turn up tonight um, and check your paperwork. Um, but I think there's a lot more people getting involved in getting the license. I get a lot of questions about licensing. Um, and that's that's good. So there's definitely a movement. People are asking me how they get licenses um, and how the process works. So that's positive. And all you can do is support them, people, in trying to get a license because if they're trying the best, then you've got to offer them support. Um, but, yeah, breed, people should be looking for breeders that have got licenses. They should be able to see mum and dad. Um We've seen a lot of times like when people are buying pups and they say, Did you see mum and dad? And they're like, Oh, well, I seen mum, but you know, I didn't see dad. Um, sometimes people use stud dogs, so you don't always see dad, but you should be able to see pictures. And if me as a breeder, if someone used one of my stud dogs and the uh, and the potential owner wanted to see the dad, I'd more than happy to take dad to them. So people should be willing to do that if asked. Um, it might also be that, you know. They need to see what kind of living conditions they're in and what, you know, are they in a busy household? You know, if you're buying, I struggle with the child thing that like I don't have any children around me to expose pups to children. I have to find a friend that's got kids. Um, You know, so that's, that's, I see that as a flaw of my own because I can't expose puppies to children because I don't have any. Um, so if someone was buying, a puppy with lots of children in the house I'd have to set that puppy up for success around them kids more because obviously mine aren't around kids um so you know there's a lot to think about and you should be looking at the environment they're in and you, you've got to really sort of vet them ask questions don't be scared to ask questions ask for photos you know you should be getting updates you should be getting video updates you should be you know there should be no grey areas. You shouldn't ever think, mm, I'm not sure about that. Doesn't make sense. Data births. Some I've heard people have issues with data births, like not adding up. People getting puppies a lot earlier than what they should have done because they've lied about the data birth. Dogs getting bought without microchips or vaccinations. You know, they, they should be vaccinated. They should have microchips. If you're buying a dog that hasn't got a microchip and not vaccinated, I'm wondering what where it's come from because it's strange. And that's a big red flag. Um, you see, I do see it a lot like, oh, I've got a pup and it's not had any vaccinations. I'm like, why? Like, what's gone on? Why has it not had vaccinations? Which means to me that they're not a licensed breeder because they don't want to go to the vets and say they've had a litter because they don't want to, or they don't want the cost of it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's difficult, but there's, there's lots of questions to ask. And Peter, the breeders should be honest with people about yeah. data births, especially data births, because I see a lot of pups going to homes 
that are, are too young. We, we see that a lot, don't we? Like, Absolutely. you get your puppet, oh, six weeks. Why? But there should be something out there to educate people. Do not take a puppy from a mum early because that has such a big impact. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was going to say um, that there are some absolutely phenomenal, amazing ethical breeders out there. Like, you breed to keep lines, not for colours, that kind of thing. Um, and there are amazing ethical breeders out there. So, like, you see blanket statements on Facebook about greeders, uh, backyard breeders, all of this kind of stuff. But you don't see the education that is actually needed. So when I frightened this poor woman about licensing, which was not my intention, it was first time dog owner. And I thought, well, I want you to do it correctly. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean to scare her. But I think... The onus is on the councils. If the council's going to do licensing, great. But well, educate the general public what they're looking for. Because like you said, when you get a dude with an unvaccinated, unmicrochipped, unsocialised uh, puppy, then they're taken away from mum far too young because they got bored of the one to the cash. They haven't been to the vets ever. You know, these are all massive red flags. But I think the onus should be on the council because... You know, the, you, you've you only got so much as a reach, haven't you, as an individual breeder on social media. And you can share as much as you want, but it doesn't mean it's going to reach every single potential owner out there. So I do think that the council should hand out leaflets. So you should be able to go on the council website, what to look for in a breeder, here's our standards. And then, like you said, if people see low stars, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad breeder. It's it may mean that they've just entered into it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so there's lots of things to consider and think about. And I think, well, dog welfare, animal welfare in the UK is appalling anyway. But I do think there should be better standards where the council do express that, you know, this is how breeders are. Instead of just like you've got a miserable neighbour who's whinging about barking, it should be, OK, so you're about to get a puppy. Here's what to look for. And I think there should also be resources and support for breeders as well, for the good ones, not people that are just trying to make some quick cash yeah. yeah absolutely because like i said breeders do get a really bad rap um and i know there's loads of breeders out there that really do do their best like so that not only do you not have children but you don't have family close by with children which you know that makes it difficult for you because it's not like you can just go into the street and say to a random person <laughs> you kid want to fuss a box of puppets <laughs> that would be totally unethical and it like yeah, no, just loads of problems around that. <laughs> but in doing yourself down, you've also got to do yourself up in that you do do a lot of like stimulation, don't you? Yeah. Um, so they're, don't... All, they're all pretty much trained before they go. Mine, the toilet. I'm a hundred percent make sure the toilet trained because there's nothing worse because that, that's the main reason why people rehome two hours. And they put belly bands on them, which is unethical, causes UTIs, rashes, burns. Yeah. Not it's nice, is it? Toilet training. And I just go, you see these people with like mats in every corner of the house. And like, that's my biggest fear. Like, and I always check up with the people that got the books, how are you getting on? And they all do really, really well, you know, because I've done, they've all had basic training. They all know the name. They all do a sit down. You know how to do recall, you know. And I offer that support ongoing and they all come back to me for either grooming or nails or training. And it's really nice. I have good close relationships with them all, really. Um, and the ones that had some one one particular one who went to a house that has foster children. Um, and we actually had the children come down and like play with the puppy and sit quite a few times before the puppy went there. So I did my best to try and get the puppy integrated with kids and that that one was actually my biggest fear and it's done fantastic because i was like oh god it's not being around kids and it's going to be around lots of kids um and that one's been fine no issues um but yeah it, it it's a lot because i think about them all the time right I sometimes i sat there like i need to check on such and such and it, they, i'm always messaging like every now and again i message to make sure they're okay and part of my contracts are that if they don't want the dog anymore it's to come back to me um and i think more breeders need to do that because then i would either keep the pup or i would find a more appropriate home or make sure that dog was mentally stable before it got rehomed yeah um if something had happened yeah that's what obviously i went through that with the wolf dogs not diesel but that's a different story 
that was not a good experience. <laughs> um, I needed very much more guidance and stuff, but um, from going from through the trauma, my experience at the kennels, I thought where Diesel was coming from was a palace in comparison. Little did I know. But little things like this, like it all adds up, doesn't it, to setting you up for success with your dog, any breed, before they even come home. And you've got puppy culture now, you've got variations of puppy culture, you've got early early neurological stimulation, early sense stimulation. There's so many things that breeders actually do now. And when people are looking at the price, they don't consider that these packages cost the breeders money or purchasing the materials for early neurological stimulation, early sense stimulation costs money. Um, obviously, the, the time put into the training. And you're giving up a bond, aren't you? Because it must be really difficult to not bond over 14 weeks. I mean, even eight weeks. I mean, that must be really tough not to bond with these puppies. It, yeah, it's hard. It is hard. Um, I know that, and I always know they're going to somewhere nicer. And I think if I didn't, if I wasn't sure of that, then I wouldn't let him go. I'd just keep him. But you know, <laughs> so it's just a case of, you know, they're in good hands. And I do worry about them. Of course, you will. I do worry about them, but you know, you've got they've got nice homes. And some of them, you know, have got fun. They're treated like absolute royalty, some of them. And I have to get these pictures. And even, to be honest, even with my stud dogs now, I have really good relationships where I usually see them growing up throughout the process and they send me pictures. And it's, it's really nice. And sometimes them pups then come, like, want to have training or whatever, help with nails or whatever it may be. They, I've got such a good bond with this, the people that use the studs as well. So... You know, there's there's more to it now, and I enjoy the stub side more than having litters because I find having litters it's it's emotionally quite taxing. So technically, then we've gone through a very brief what to look for any breeder to set your puppy up for the best success possible. Um, so now we covered breeding. What do you think should happen when the puppy reaches the owner's home, like? so far as training goes and moving forward how they're going to raise this dog and then moving away from the negative stereotypes and all of the grim stuff that we've talked about i think there definitely there needs to be more education and videos of people training small dogs because there isn't enough out there for people to realize that them dogs are capable of doing the same things as large breed dogs there's definitely a gap in the market because if i put a dog doing training on some of these groups, I think people would just be absolutely shocked. Do you think some people get small breeds because they think they don't have to train or walk them? Um, maybe so. Maybe so. I think there's definitely starting to be a shift in the shifting things. I have seen a few groups now being set up where it's for dogs for two hours that do training. So that's really refreshing to see that there is groups for them kind of two hours and are definitely on like TikTok as well and things like that. You're seeing a lot of travellers doing more training and that's really refreshing and I think there just needs to be more of it. So people think, actually, oh, my chihuahua or small breed could probably do that. Um, They're not just to be sat on your lap. They're capable of doing agility and all sorts, or whatever, the world's the oyster. So they're more than capable of doing anything. Obviously, there is some hindrances, I think, with kit um, and getting kit for small breeds. Um. I've struggled with it and I think there's definitely a market there for like small breed kit because even like getting some cones, you know, it everything's really high. It's, it's becoming really more prevalent though, isn't it? Like fit bones, they do the tiny bones. The tiny ones, yeah. It's becoming and I find that it's much easier to find small breed dog stuff than it is large breed dog stuff because I'm at the other spectrum yeah, of it. There's yeah. like there's no happy medium. Yeah, there's no medium. It, there's no medium with it. it you have struggles if you've got massive dogs or tiny dogs it's all for dogs in between yeah so um yeah. so you, we're talking about perceptions and attitudes changing towards small breeds of dogs your perceptions and attitudes have changed vastly over the years haven't they so do you want to talk about how your perceptions and attitudes were to begin with when i first met you to how they are now um i probably didn't do as much with them 
as what I could because I've been had bad experiences. Um, and I think to this day, if I'm having a bad week, I still it puts me off a little bit still. Um, but they have done they've done all the training and everything now, and they 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 do fabulous. To be fair, um, I think it, it's difficult, isn't it? It's it's really hard to try and inspire other people without being you don't want to get picked off. It's really hard because yeah. I know I should be doing it because I should be doing it to help other people. But at the same time, you've got to be mentally in the right place to share it to have the backlash. Yeah, because you're putting yourself in a place of vulnerability, aren't you? Because our relationship is much different where I've pushed you from day one to like to do training, go for the walk, um, put your dog down. They've got a four leg. <laughs> they don't need carrying upstairs. Um, and that wasn't to be cruel. It was about confidence building because your dogs massively lack confidence, not for any fault of your own, yeah. not for a fault of the breeding, just simply for the trauma that others have put you through. And I think that's important to be transparent about and for people to recognise that people have caused you trauma, which then has put you off and made you feel vulnerable. And it was a result of that your dogs weren't as confident as they are now. Oh yeah, Would you like, say that's about fair. Recent pups are very different to the dogs that I had years ago. Like they're bulletproof now, and that is just my development as a breeder and a person, and the training that I've done. I wish them first ones were like these ones are now, because these ones are they you wouldn't they have no fear <laughs> at all. Like little PJ. Nothing stops him. Like he's the tiniest little chihuahua I've ever seen, and he's just bulletproof. He does middle if he's worried, <laughs> and he gets out of the way. He does everything. That's like, not what you said to start off with. No, no. <laughs> Norma. <laughs> but you know the 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 older ones are still. I still have some behavior problems there. But it's much better than what it was, oh, isn't it? percent better than it was, but they aren't ever going to be like these new ones. They're never going to be as resilient as them because I've brought them up different. And that's through my development as a person. And exactly. And yeah. I'd love to explain to people, like, look at this dog and look at this dog. And that's purely because they're being raised differently. So same genetics. Same genetics. Some different of the same attitude. There's different attitude. Some of yeah, them because the same parents, just different attitude. People probably won't believe that we spent many hours on a night training. What was it back then? 14 to hours going upstairs and downstairs by themselves yeah. for and hours because it's such a slow process. And that trauma was because I'd seen on one of the groups that a trauma had fallen down and died. And that's exactly why I was carrying them. And it was easy for you to carry them out the front Please door, carry. into the front door. Yeah. Just picking them up all the time, wasn't it? Or even with the vehicles, I'll pick them up, put them into the vehicle. Yeah. Now I've got too many, you can't do it, they've got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you bred Norma's litter, and then obviously we started doing training as soon as we possibly could, and you, you would message me for about a year saying, I'm going to kill you because she's a nightmare. Well, what do you mean she's a nightmare? Well, she's doing this, that and the other. And I'm like, so she's a dog then? <laughs> But that was a massive learning experience for you, wasn't it? It's from having very quiet, anxious, meek dogs to Norma, who's like, slams the door open, I'm here. Yeah, Norma's <laughs> But yeah, they're very different now. And as I love them all, but I wish they were all as confident as what the, the, the these are now. But I've got through a lot. Like, for example, Dolly. Dolly was rescued. Um from a situation it was a home rescue and I went and got her um but she never played with toys until this year never played with a toy and how did you get a play with a toy well we, we spent hours <laughs> we spent it was hours. a cat toy it was a cat toy yeah <laughs> it took a lot of hours a lot of hours I to the point where Dolly, I had to sew her her own pouch to put treats in it because we bought the pouch toys and they were too big and she couldn't carry it because it was too heavy. So I had to make her own pouch. 
So we had sewing skills and all sorts going on here. And now I bought a toy, like I bought a toy of the week, like a little rabbit thing, didn't I? And she straight away fetching it. And she would have never even picked, she didn't even say a toy. And I see her now and she's, she's standing in the living room and she's like flicking toys around. I'm like, look at her, playing with toys. And you never think, but it's taking a lot of time, but it's come through. And even though people may have older, smaller breeds, they shouldn't give up on them. It's still possible to do things. You see that a lot of my small dog don't play with toys. But why? You need to just practice. You need you need a Tasha to come and harass your soul. Yeah. Um but no, seriously, um, because obviously I'm all about consent, biological needs, that kind of stuff. And it did take a lot of me nagging you, didn't it, to get you because like I said, being transparent about trauma, because obviously other people listening. If you've been through trauma the same as Natalie as well, even if your dog's 10 and you've never done anything with them because of the trauma that's personal to you, you can still change. Yeah. You know, um, you can still change their lives now. Don't dwell on it. Don't focus on, oh, but we've never done anything before. Why start now? My YouTube has got like 1,500 videos for free, tutorials. Just go and watch it. There's nothing stopping, yeah, nothing stopping you at all. And... As hesitant as you was, you're so much happier now that you changed them over to the raw diet. You're happy that you did the stairs training, that you don't pick them up anymore unless it's essential. You encourage them to play, teach them to play. You do the training with them. You put your videos out there on public, on social media. Yeah, It's a big change, isn't it, for you as a person as well? Yeah, I don't do enough videos and I wish I could do more to help other people, but it's, I'm not there yet. Um, but I think eventually, hopefully, I will be able to help more people with that. Because I think there is a need for more to be out there to encourage people to do more with the dogs. Um, regardless of it being small, small breeds. And it's just changing your mindset and your attitudes as well, isn't it? Like, just because you've got a small dog doesn't mean that you can't do anything with them. Like, oh, there are small breeds that don't need to go for a walk. Absolutely not. Even if you just go for a walk round the block and it's an hour of sniffing, that is major enrichment for that little dog. Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't even understand the ancestry of small breed dogs, do they? Like, you know, uh, Chihuahuas, Mexican Ratters, Jack Russells, Ratters, Dachshunds, sent down Badger Thet. Most small breed dogs were actually bred by working class people for a hunting job. Yeah. Whether it's protecting farms from rats or whether it badgers uh, for bovine diseases or whether it's small dogs to basically hunt to eat. And small dogs are a very old breed as well, aren't they? Yeah. So if you want to talk more about that as well, just so people know what they're getting when they... Yeah, I think... Or what they've got. People don't do enough research on the smaller breeds, so they need to look at the backgrounds into the breeds a little bit more about what they're getting. Because I think I don't think people realise, like you were saying, they could be have a ratting background. So you need to set yourself up for that. It's you know you need to be engaging that and in an activity. Like we've done scent work with some of mine. They're all careful with doing stuff, but you've got to pick up on their strengths and what they like to do. And you know I think there needs to be more education on doing breed specific research and thinking this is what breed I'm getting because. I think people would be surprised what we've got in the living room, to be honest. They'd be like, oh, my dog were a ratter. Like, you know, or my dog was used like, for guarding. And it might be like the small, a small breed. They just don't realise because they've thought, oh, I'm just getting a small breed because it'd be easier, you know, to get them in that car. I might be easier for less walking. That's what they think. But there's more to it, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Just because they're a small breed of dog doesn't mean that they don't still have the biological needs of a large breed dog. Yeah. Um, which is what many people don't consider. Uh, I've seen it with pugs as well, Frenchies, dogs across the spectrum. Like I keep saying, it's not just about Chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers. Yeah. Um, one Yorkshire Terrier that was just dressed up in raincoats and dresses and stupid outfits all the time. And this poor Yorkshire Terrier had such a miserable life like she was so reactive she was scared to death the owner didn't want training she had no interest in training whatsoever 
But she was quite happy saying about how many 50-odd outfits she got for the dog. And it's like, you can have a jumper for your dog if it's cold, sure. Make sure that they're warm enough. But just dressing your dog up to put stupid pictures on Facebook, that you know, you're hurting your dog. And this dog was hurting because, yes, she may have been fed. She may have had water. She may have had toys. This dog didn't know how to dog because she was a doll. You know, and we see that stereotype quite a lot as well, don't we? That a lot of people dress them up. Um, or they do use them as dolls and then they put them in the prams for no medical need, push them around scared, go to bingo. The dogs are reacting because they're terrified. Oh, that dog's going to bite. Rah, 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 rah. And then it's completely wrong. Instead, the conversation should go like, hey, your dog's struggling. Maybe you should be at home. Maybe think about taking them somewhere quieter. Maybe think about training to improve their welfare, not writing them off as ratters um, or saying unkind things mm -hmm. or saying that they're not a proper dog. They are a proper dog. They're an ancient breed. They're, they're much older than German Shepherds, definitely much older than wolf dogs. They're much older than a lot of dogs. Um, they are a dog. You know, people have got to be mindful of this. Um, and when your attitudes change, owners' attitudes will change. So it's not just about small breed dog owners and you know they've got to go through a personal development course it's about the general public as well because you're just as responsible if i think they're rat yeah. um, by making unkind comments to owners um and if you reach out and say hey you know what there's actually a podcast that you can listen to because what you're doing to your dog is overwhelming them and it's stressing them out and then when they tune in and listen they may, may think then oh okay so I thought I was doing the right thing, but I was doing the wrong thing, but I'm willing to learn. That opens up a conversation, and that's going to be much better for small breed welfare, isn't it? Mm, yeah. It was the same with yourself, wasn't it? Like, once we got past the walls and the defence mechanisms, and then you actually did switch to RAW, for example, you saw behaviour changes, what, within one to two weeks? Yeah. And what do you always say to clients now? Raw. <laughs> and... You always say, I wish you'd done it sooner, didn't I you? I done it sooner, yeah. Yeah, there's certain changes that you can implement that have massive impacts that people don't even realise, um, mainly to do with food. Um, and there's lots of behaviour training you can do. I think there needs to be more focus on fun training, like we could do tricks and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be like just obedience. It can be really fun stuff that you can do with your dog and enrichment and things. You know, there's load the world's oyster. Just pick an activity that you enjoy. Like mine all do different stuff. Like they don't all do the same stuff. Um, depending on the dog. And I think people need to find what their dog likes a little bit more. Yeah. I think definitely moving away from obedience, moving towards concept training. Yeah. Instead is a much better way to go because obedience, as much as people don't like to admit it, it is becoming a thing in the past. It's not something that, you know, owners want to do anymore. Not something that trainers want to train anymore. And it may be a quick cash cow for you to set up classes and take money off people in group sessions. But owners are wising up to it, aren't they? We are, we've talked about this a lot. And dogs do thrive on games and chihuahuas yeah. thrive on games, don't they? Like game learning yeah. instead of obedience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a big market out there for other methods and ways and don't have to be boring training. It's it's meant to be fun. It's meant to be about building a bond with your dog and having a connection rather than it being like we're gonna do sits and downs and stairs today. Like it's just it's not exciting. There needs to be a mixture of stuff for it to make people want to do training with the dogs. Yeah, and I I do think that collectively, like not just owners, not just the general public, the council, they need to do more. Professionals, we need to do more. Um, obviously, like I've got YouTube videos of Chihuahuas and your guys and stuff, but it's no good just a few people doing it. Everybody needs to get on board and do it and advocate for these dogs. Um, like for example, on TikTok, there's an awful account where this woman in America takes great joy in torturing her poor dog. There's a Chihuahua, several videos a day, taunting it, making it react aggressively, thinking she's hilarious. And she gets about 300,000 likes a video. Everyone who's liking that video is responsible for her torture and abusing that dog. 
to do it, Mark. Yeah, because it is abuse. She's putting that dog in a negative emotional state for what? To get famous on a, some stupid little app, mm. which is ridiculous. And then last night I saw a lovely video where a child was playing with its owner like Diesel does with me, and he was sat on the arm of the sofa, and the owner was, like, looking at the dog like this. And then the dog was looking back like this, and then he was, like, sneaking in, like, with licks and kisses and stuff. I think I can actually show you the video now. So if you're listening to the podcast, you have to tune in if you want to see the video. But it made me really happy because it was so nice to see just a, a totally different Chihuahua video. And I was like, yes, that is what we need to be seeing. And it was super duper cute. Uh, there was no aggression. The owner wasn't winding it up. It was the same as playing with a large breed dog. So I'll just, there you go. I did see that, actually. So there's no growling. It's just cheeky licks, kisses. The the dog's playing, kissing its owner, having a lovely time. He's happy. He's got a soft expression. And even though he's showing a little bit of way of light, he's just literally the position that the dog's in. Yeah. And the chihuahua's doing, like, a little bit of a smile as well. But smiling is, is appeasement. And appeasement can be used in play. But... I'd much rather see videos like that than I would as someone abusing their dog, making them do aggressive things just for some likes. I mean, that's got 316,000 likes. That should be at millions of likes because it's so nice to see. It is so refreshing to see. Um, and like I say, and it, it sort of breeds, isn't it? You know, do more with your dog, literally. literally. Do more. With your dog, it doesn't matter what breed they are. Um, and if you do have medical problems like Norma, yeah. running through your Let amazing me. list of dogs, uh, Norma, and who else is it? Sorry, um, Luma, one leg, Luma, yeah. that was it. So, I had the name on the tip of my tongue. And we just work around it and we just do different stuff, exactly. So, you haven't wrote her off, she's done hydrotherapy, has canine chiropractor. Well, they both do. Um, and then you've done swimming with them, you do scent work with them, canine conditioning with them, tricks with them. So you haven't wrote them off and says you can't do anything now, then that's it. Mm. You don't not take them for walks. Yeah, do everything in our so if you want to talk about that a little bit more as well, that even if your dog has medical problems, how yeah. you would then start moving forward towards doing stuff with them. Yeah, I think you need, if you obviously they've got something wrong, you need to go to your vets, find out specifically what that problem is, and then seek advice from that point onwards. So if they put you on to a hydrotherapist or a canine chiropractor, for example, um, me and Tasha use McTimony chiropractors, um, and then they can give you an assessment of what's good and what's bad and how the severity of, of what's going on. And then they can help you put plans in place, like not to make it worse. and things that you can do to help um so you know don't just write that dog off work with it right okay so she, she's not going to be running the marathon she's not going to be doing i'm not going to be doing running with her but she can do all this other stuff so just because they can't do one specific activity doesn't mean that they can't do other activities and it doesn't mean that i'm going to put her in a push chair either because i still need to see use a leg so you know we just keep going and we just keep building on it and in fact the the stuff we've done with Luma she had one bad leg and actually now we're saying that it's hardly got a problem now so I've actually fixed it because I, I, I sought help I went to the vets found out what was going on then I did everything that I needed to do and now we're just building muscle and actually I've nearly fixed the problem it's not all about crate rest is it no no and it, it's, it does help sometimes if you need it, but you've got to keep on moving because the more they sit there, the worse it seems to get. So if you speak to your vet and they're like, your dog needs to be on crate rest, get a second opinion. No one's going to punish you for getting a second opinion because the more and more that we learn about dogs and their medical needs, the more that we're learning and vets are teaching us, vets that study in this field are saying, crate rest is the worst possible thing for many dogs because remember... Every dog's an individual and you can't lump them all into the same category. Um, and many dogs need that muscle build-up, not being left in a crate for six weeks plus. And then you're getting more behavioural problems 
Um, so if you've got the chance, like I haven't, but if you've got the chance, go to an holistic vet or at the very least an integrated vet. Um, so a holistic vet, they do work herbally and they don't write herbs off. They do use holistic services such as hydrotherapy, um, canine chiropractors, physiotherapists, homeopaths, all that kind of stuff. An integrated vet, they will do the best of both worlds. So it's what suits your dog as an individual. Your consultations are longer. Um, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Spend an hour at the vets, that's amazing. Because they're trying to gather as much data about your dog and information about what makes them a unique individual. Diagnose their individual symptoms. Not just say, oh, well, it's this problem then. And then just write them off or say, you know, you're going to have to go and see a specialist for a surgeon sort of thing. Um, fear free vet, more prevalent in America, but we do have them in the UK. So if you're a larger area, like you are, Natalie, it's much easier to find vets of different paths, isn't it? Rather than like myself, I'd have to travel two hours to go to a homeopathic vet. Yeah. Uh, holistic vet, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more options out there. It's just finding it and knowing what, if you search that specific thing, then you'll find it. Um, But I think they're, they're becoming more more popular with people, definitely. Yeah. There's more options out there. Yeah. So I think my takeaway from this is that to treat, it doesn't matter what dog you've got, whether it's a puppy or rescue, it doesn't matter what breed they are, treat them as an individual dog. And don't go out there with a the mindset of, I'm getting a dog because I want to do xyz sport and don't get a dog because i don't have to walk this breed or i can put them in a pram um they're going to be easy they're going to be a lap dog that sort of thing when you do choose to get your puppy or rescue dog or you rehome a dog be like this dog is going to be part of my family and i'm going to do my very best to meet their needs find out what they like and don't like and then i'm going to work with it to the best of my ability but writing them off from the start is just not the way to go. And I think you've taught us quite a lot about that tonight, Natalie. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to add particularly? No. No? You Put feel you on. covered everything? Put it on, yeah. <laughs> and how would you like to wrap up before questions? And I think just like you say, every you should give them a chance and you should people should just do more with it. Um and there's, there's groups out there like the community group where it's a safe place to, to share your, your videos. Um, some of the breed specific groups aren't for that because you're just going to be, you're just going to look strange because you're not going to be sitting with the norm. Don't be normal, be different. Do stuff with your dogs. Show and what should people do when they see the Hannibal photoshopped pictures or they see abuse videos? They shouldn't be liking them because they're just encouraging people to do it more. And you do see that a lot online, and it's sad. Um, people think it's funny, and there's not enough awareness out there for the damage that's been done to that dog's mental, mental state. So go one step further from just not liking the post. What else can they do to help that individual dog virtually, basically? If you can, if you feel confident enough, you should reach out and say that dog isn't comfortable. You need need to get professional help. Um, even that's if that's an inbox or a comment, if you're feeling brave, or just don't like the video. If you're not outspoken, you also... just ignore it. Just or put an angry face because it shouldn't be getting publicised. There's been a funny. It's not funny. Because there's a lot of worry about being called a Karen, or I can't remember what the male version is yeah. of it that they say. But you can also click the three dots and report it. Yeah, just report the content. And if you report it and you say why you're reporting it and you put that it's abuse, you know, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, they will have to do something about it. Yeah. And if they get enough reports, they're going to have to take it down, you know, whether they want to keep it up or not, because it does violate community standards. It breaks the law in the UK and most European countries. Um, making a dog stressed out is against the law. Check out the Animal Welfare Act of 2006 and the Five Freedoms. I'm not making it up to fit my own agenda. It is literally the law. Um, whether you get as policed or not is a different story, but I guarantee you if enough people report these videos, they're going to have to start doing something about it and starting out these uh, complaints, giving the RSPCA warrants with the police to go into these homes, 
and start looking at what is being done to these dogs. Um, and obviously they're not going to abuse a dog in front of these people. Um, but what the police can do is seize the phones because the RSPCA are only a charity. We have one inspector for the entire of Lincolnshire. You know, such so a poor woman has to go through hundreds of calls a day, find out which are the worst ones that she can get to in that day. So you're looking at five tops that she can get to. Um, so just bear in mind that it takes all of us to be responsible. You can't just place it on a charity, you know, and then they, they have to beg the police for a warrant. They have to show there's enough evidence of abuse to begin with for the police to say, yes, we'll speak to a judge about a warrant. So I know the RSPCA get a lot of flack, but you've got to see it from both sides. From somebody who's worked with them, there's a lot more to it um, than just upsetting people and getting on the wrong side of people for social media. Um, and what RSPCA managers do, uh, whether they take money and stuff, that's nothing to do with the little people who go to the homes, the little people who have to deal with it, the animals that they find in these horrible situations. So just remember to be kind to the right people and not kind yeah. to the people who don't deserve it. You know, it's very twisted and messed yeah. up, isn't it? Yeah. Just absolutely crazy. Um, but thank you very much. And I'm sure that that's going to help lots and lots of people. And you've just advocated for lots and lots of breeds of dogs. So you should be very proud of yourself. Um, has anybody got any questions? I know Debbie, you're here at the moment. If you've got any questions. Yeah, I've got questions as such. No, I can relate to a lot of what you said to other breeds and myself and other people. It's interesting about the pups. Do you think if you have less pups in a litter rather than just one, it makes a difference? Yeah, I think the the more depending on the personalities of the pups, but I think the more you have it tends they tend to be better socially. Um definitely. I think if you've got one or two sometimes they can have issues, more issues than than the, the bigger litters. Yeah, yeah. I think this is from a smaller litter. Yeah, which is difficult because with small breeds they tend to have like two or three anyway, so they generally are from small small litters as well. So there's that's a problem in itself. But you can t I can tell straight away when they've come from when they've been in little in small litters. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's my dog. I think I didn't know when I got her that they said afterwards breeders chatting on the phone said that some of the her litter mates have died. So, yeah. Oh. Oh. That made a difference. It depends on what oh. stage they, they passed away at, whether it was in the first couple of days or if there's got fading puppy syndrome, it can happen up to quite late on. So they, they can have, they can be in the litter till they're nearly going and then something can happen. Um, They can fade away over a period of time. So they may have been the litter mates for a long period or a short period, depending on what was wrong or why they passed away. Uh, maybe I should after two years ask why, but I you just you you've got the puppy, so you let it go, don't you? You don't, really. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <sighs> well, thank you very much. No problem. Um, and then if anyone's got any questions after this, including yourself, Debbie, you can reach out to Natalie at. You can contact Jot. What shall I do? My um business page. So it is NK9 Dog Training and Behaviour. Wicked. Okay. And you can see more of Natalie's videos at the Miyagi's Dog Training Community. Yeah. Um, and you can reach out to Natalie and ask her, and she does like to be helpful. Um, or you can drop us an email at mm -hmm. Mutz and Mischief at gmail.com that's also on the website so if you didn't catch that um it's www.mutsandmischief.com and then our contact details are on there for email and even if you want to do a website query um and that would be more than happy to help won't you yeah that's nice. awesome thank you. well thank you very much for an awesome coffee hour which is always more like two hours yeah. Um, thank you for your time and sharing your experiences because I know that was a big 
deal for you um, and sharing everything that you've done with your own dogs, which is hopefully going to help more dogs. Um, thank you for coming live, Debbie. Um, and then we'll be back in two weeks for another Coffee Hour podcast. Um, so we shall see you all then. Bye. See you soon.